collective, and we came together. Um, I'm actually newer to the group. Um, Kate was part of the founding group in response to the George Floyd murder and seeing so many folks coming out on the streets here in Anacortes, hundreds of us were out protesting and saying this is not okay. And I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that you both, or all of you, have spent your morning to come here to talk about this, to process this, to maybe be a little uncomfortable with this. And I just want to thank you for that, because it feels really lonely. I don't know if you feel that way too, but there's a lot of hopelessness, there's a lot of rage, there's a lot of unprocessed stuff that's going on for us, for all of us. But in particular, as white people who are noticing that change needs to happen, and what we're hearing and understanding now is that it needs to come from us. We need to step up our game. So we can do that together. Look at all of us here. I'm so excited to share what we found out and then what we want to do with that after now. So um, you've come here early. We want to know why. Why are you here? And in the interest of time, would you please take a moment to just turn towards the person that's next to you, maybe someone that's not in your family, to just share a few sentences about why you decided to come. Take about five minutes. <laughs> 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 that racism and anti-Semitism and, you know, it just seems to be part of what life here is. And yet all our written documents, our belief, our everything specifically says you, that is immoral, that's sinful. And how does this, how does it go on and on? And what's the attraction for it to keep up? Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, I'm hearing you kind of acknowledge that there is anti-racism, anti-Semitism here, and it's been normalized, and that we know it as a as a, a group of faith that you acknowledge that this is sinful yeah. ways of being. Sinful and we, and it's written down that it's sinful. I mean. Yeah, even in the big book, yeah. Yeah. Still, it's written down. And and how can we do that? You know, some folks have talked about it being like being a fish in water, trying to describe water. It's really difficult, but if we can start noticing that, oh, there's a little, there's a, this current here, what's that? Oh, I must be in some kind of thing that's allowing me to move this certain way. That can be really helpful in what we can help each other do as a community committed to anti-racism and anti-Semitism. And so somehow all of those currents did end up allowing to bring us all here today, which is really good. 
Um, I'm wondering, would anybody else be willing to share what they what they what interested them in coming here today? I'd like just like to learn more about our history. I don't know all of these things. Yeah. Yeah. Neither did we. Yeah. And um, just to briefly introduce this project to you, um, my name is Kate Clark. Uh, Kate Clark. I grew up in Anacortes, and moved away, and came back. Um, and then got involved with these amazing people. Uh, maybe we can just say our names. Anastasia Brensick. Rochelle Kalohoff. Patty Cascade. Kate Masika. And um, like Anastasia was saying, um, kind of with this feeling of, um, we know it's bad, but somehow it's all around us. Um, particularly during the George Floyd murder, um, there was a lot of community conversation that was happening online. And we noticed kind of a repeated refrain of, well, Anacortes isn't racist, we don't have a racist history. And that's by design, right? That we don't necessarily know the, the architecture of our, <laughs> the makings of that racism. And so we actually just stole, we copycatted an idea that we saw in Bellingham. There was someone in Bellingham that just made a written document that listed some of the events in Bellingham. And so we said, well, we could do that here. And we wanted to take it a step further because they just had listed material but without the sources referenced. And that seems like a really important thing to, to be able to have that primary document that people can refer to. And so at the time, I was working at the Anacortes Museum with Will McCracken here. And there was a big event that happened, which was they digitized all of the Washington State newspapers. So it became a lot easier to find material like this because all of a sudden it became word searchable. So online for months, probably, we would meet and just have sessions with us and some other community members. One of them is here today. Katie Eastman helped us out along with many other folks who were just willing to spend time researching our really ugly history. Um, and so that's basically what we developed here. And we call it an incomplete timeline because of course these are just the moments that made the historic ledger. So you can only imagine <laughs> what percentage that probably is actually in the, in the creation and um, maintenance of our of our town and the way that it is. And so, um, anyways, we um, we're thinking that maybe. So, do you all have a copy? Great. So, um, every every uh, moment in time that you see here has an article, um, a, a newspaper article or scholarly article that is associated with it. So if you want to learn more about it, um, on the back side here, there is a link that you can go into it and actually read the original document. But we're thinking maybe for now, um, who here has had time uh, to spend with this so far? Has anyone seen this before? Okay. okay. Most of us have not, okay. So we were thinking for now, for the next, um, let's say, eight minutes, <laughs> uh, spend some time looking through this. And what we're going to do afterwards is we're actually going to, as a group, read out some of these moments in time together that stood out to you, and we'll talk about that a little bit. So feel free with your neighbor to spend some time looking this over.
So we'll look at this for two more minutes and then we'll come back together to have a conversation. And in these last couple of minutes, if, if there's one of these moments in time that really stands out to you, just think about if you would be willing to read it out loud to the group. August 11th, 1921. <laughs> Former Westminster Presbyterian Minister W.A. Stevenson gives a sermon against the Japanese. <laughs> Who else? Well, you can really take a moment to um, sense how that feels in your body. It's really important for us to feel that. That might feel uncomfortable, and that's okay. Um, just, just acknowledge and notice that. January 15, 1992. Minority students in Anacortes struggle against pressure 
to conform to white society. Mm -hmm. Overt acts of racism are infrequent, but the racism experienced can be more subtle. Other students sometimes make fun of the way she and her friends talk and mimic the slang they use outside the school. The racism can take the form of a disapproving look. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we've all seen that. I was named the May 3rd, 1989. The local attempt to change a city bed and breakfast ordinance and the Mayor Jim Rice, this has to be said, this whole issue is on account of race. This is the only reason this came up. I hope it never comes up again. I'm sure many of us in here remember that. I know we had just started remodeling Watermark when that happened. That was the, not, not the greatest time of our town by any means. Well, none of these are. Kay, did you have something? Yeah. October 11th, 1906. Inventor of the iron chink demonstrates its use in Anacortes, showing it to be a success in every way the iron shank replaces the labor of predominantly Chinese cannery workers. With the machine, workers process fish 50 to 75 percent faster. And the reason that struck me is because when we first moved here, we were told our chink daughter was not safe coming near our office. One that struck me because um, I lived in Japan a couple of years, but July 21st, 1915, a mob of 300 plus men packs council chambers and city hall and marches to homes of cannery owners to demand the immediate removal of Japanese laborers. This is a great segue because we'd like to read that out loud. We'd like to have you um, kind of bear witness to what that looked like at the time because it was written down. And so we have a two-page, um, what do you call it? Uh, script. Script, thank you. <laughs> um, that uh, we'd like to pass out and have um, you all read it to, out loud together. So whoever has the, um, yeah, we're gonna pass those out. Whoever's willing to read out loud. <clears throat> and we, we invite you to stand up and read the first paragraph, and then the next person stands up and reads the next paragraph. Does that feel okay? Yeah. We could have coached you better. Um, so what we're passing out is directly pulled from the Anacortes American from that moment in time. Everything you read is from that article, which is very interesting because it reads almost like a play. There's a lot of long quotations. Um, so what we were thinking, if you're willing to read and to project, is each person who wants to read will stand up and read a paragraph. And then the next person stands up and reads the next paragraph. And we'll just go around in a circle until we finish it. It will take about 12 minutes for us to read this. And there's a lot of names. So before we go into reading it as a group, I just wanted to introduce these people, these names to you that are listed in this article. So we have E.V. Anson, who's a city council member. We have E.V. O'Grady who is the principal speaker of the crowd who was arrested the day before for inciting this mob. We have the sheriff, Ed Wells, who deputized just a, well, a dozen, right? What is the score? How many? What's the score? Does anybody know? 20. 20. 20. 20. 20 citizens. 20 citizens were deputized to respond to this mob of 300 people um, by this sheriff 
we have the first mayor of Anacortes, um, Hogan, who uh, shows up also as a Confederate soldier um, earlier in the timeline. So that's who Hogan is. Um, we have a mural of him at the City Hall. Um, so then we have W.A. Lowman, maybe a familiar name to some of you, and Fred Fulton, who are the local cannery men, so the people who run the canneries. We have Councilman Dovers, the chairman of the meeting. We have City Clerk Cortland C. Temple, the meeting secretary. City Council Member Allen. And then we have the Reverend Henry, Fer or, excuse me, Harry Ferguson, who, sh who shows up. And then we have Councilman Jack Trafton. So, uh, do you know yeah. anything about Harry Ferguson? I actually tried to find what church he was from, and I couldn't find it. That's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, however, th this is a great thing to ask because since these documents are word searchable, if you go to WashingtonDigitalNewspapers.org, I believe, you can do keyword searches within the Anacortes American. So you could type in Ferguson and see what comes up. So it might be interesting. I mean, even just doing searches of reverend, you know, from the late 1800s to early 1900s could lead to some interesting results. So I don't know what church he was affiliated with. Does anybody here know? Okay, so are you all feeling ready to project? <laughs> um, one thing to mention too is this is a primary document, so there are racial slurs that are used in this. Um, so it's important to mention that because we're, we haven't changed the language. So there may, it may bring feelings of discomfort and that's, uh, we're holding this room as a container for that. Um, okay, is anybody willing to begin with the headings in the first paragraph? So if you're willing, please just stand up and... Oh, all danger of violence is now believed to be over. Anti-Japanese agitation subsides as rapidly as it started, and crowds take advantage advice of committee men to conduct themselves in orderly manners and go home. Investigator is arrested and saloons are closed Tuesday nights. Demonstration looked for a while as if serious results might follow. Cannery men are roused out of bed and crowds threaten to oust Orientals. Last night probably saw an end to the danger of labor troubles in Anacortes in contrast to the meeting of the night before. The crowd that gathered in front of the city hall last night was in a peaceful mood and was made up mostly of spectators. E.B. Anson, uh, one of the committee men appointed at Tuesday night mass meeting, made a report on his interviews with cannery men from a window at the city hall. The gist of his report was that local cannery men are obliged to stand by the labor contracts they made last fall, but that more white labor will be employed in local plants this year than ever before. He advised the crowd not attempt any disorder because of the fact that there were too many deputies on guard and any disorder would result in a severe sentence to E.B. O'Grady, who was arrested yesterday noon on a charge of instigating a riot. A score of more deputy sheriffs under the direction of Sheriff Ed Wells were on duty throughout the day, and some of them will remain until all danger of trouble is past. Following a demonstration against the employment of Japanese in local counties, E.B. O'Grady, the principal speaker at the mass meeting of the unemployed at the city hall Tuesday night, and Martin Hayes, a local bartender, were arrested yesterday noon by Sheriff Ed Wells on a charge of instigating a riot and were taken to the county jail. To assist the score or more special deputies hastily sworn in to preserve order, Mayor F.B. Hogan issued an order closing all saloons of the city from 1 p.m. yesterday until 5 o'clock this morning. Tuesday night's anti-Japanese demonstration consisted of a mass meeting of more than 300 men 
who packed the council chamber and filled the street in front of the city hall. After deciding to get rid of the Japanese that night, the meeting, by practically a unanimous vote, decided to take the city council along. Starting on their mission, the crowd decided to first send a delegation to wait upon local cannery men and called on W.A. Lowman and Fred Fulton at their homes at a late hour at night and told them that it was the sense of the meeting that the Japanese must go. When it began to look as if trouble would occur, Sheriff Wells was called up and arrived at a time when the delegation was calling upon Fred Fulton. The crowd was then waiting in the street for committee to return. The sheriff advised them to go home peaceably and take the matter up with the cannery men in the morning. But it was not until two o'clock in the morning that the crowd finally dispersed. When the council convened, the council chambers were packed. After hurrying through the regular order of business, the council took a recess and turned the rooms over to the mass meeting. <clears throat> Councilman Dobers was selected, was elected chairman of the meeting, and city clerk Cortland C. Temple was chosen as secretary. The first speaker was Reverend Harry Ferguson. His plea was that no harm should be done um, the Japanese laborer, as they are not to blame for accepting employment wherever they can get it. The interest that has taken, that has been um, shown here, should show these officials that some action should be taken. I belong to a great army of the unemployed. We have great natural resource, we have a great natural resource here that should greatly benefit the citizens of this place. Local people who pay taxes and are citizens should have the first benefit from this wealth by being given the first call for employment. Most of your canneries have received parcels of land from the city on which to establish their plants. And we citizens here demand first consideration as workmen in this industry that should make this city one of wealth. The unemployed of the city demand the first call. Our merchants ought to be interested we buy our groceries, we pay our taxes here. There is more poverty in Anna Porter's homes than you think. I believe in law and order, but as others are reaping our reward, we do not plead, we demand our rights. I do not blame these laboring men who have been brought here. They came because they were hired, but we demand that they take second place. Grady, who has taken a prominent part in labor matters of Anacortes, was the next speaker. I do not fully agree with the previous speaker who said we have endeavors to set the cannery men to meet with us, but they have refused. They say they cannot do anything. Their contracts are all made, but it is a matter of self-preservation with us. We are going to starve. It is to avoid trouble that we say <coughs> We say this, we appeal to you, councilmen, you businessmen, to look at the seriousness of the situation. Neglect it, and you invite violence. The, Jap the Japs can be removed peacefully or with violence. Which way, which way will it be done? I say it be done. There is no question about that. We are hungry and are going to get those jobs businessman is neglecting an opportunity to see the local citizens and taxpayer get the job that belongs to him. We invite the Chamber of Commerce here, but they fail to show up. I guess they are not hungry, not yet. There is no power but that which is in yourself. You can get anything you want if you go after it. The only reason why you are out of a job is that you, you are not worth a damn. They say they cannot depend upon light labor. How about the Jap? He is bound by ironclad contracts, which he doesn't dare to break. I have been asked who is responsible for this agitation. I am not afraid to say it. I am. This is the biggest crisis in the history of Anacortes. Let us handle it at once. Oh, yes. 
You all can get work in the canneries. If they haven't gotten enough Japs to do the work, then you will get a job, maybe for three weeks. What do you think of that, you hungry men? I say the Japs must go. If you are determined, they will have to get out of town. You are the power of the world, and if you make up your mind to do a thing, they can't stop you. It is a case of fundamentals. We must work or starve. We will go. It is up to you to say the word, and we will go. Let's go tonight, someone yelled in the crowd. Tonight's the night, Ben said O'Grady. Big night tonight. I have heard lots of fellows say, let's hang that low man. What good would that do? The Jap would still be here. I say, let's get rid of the Japs. Now, before we go, let me say, there's no desire for violence. Let us intimidate them by force of numbers. But don't forget the motto, the Jap must go. These cannery men are of the class that says, let us go down and clean Mexico, not on your life. I'm fighting for O'Grady. Let us take the city council along with us. The crowd then called for a speech from Council Allen. The latter said he was not prepared to speak on the question and stated that he did not understand how the cannery men had become undesirable at once. He counseled the crowd to see the cannery men before doing anything. He declared the cannery men had done lots for the city and should be given a chance. He said he had been told that the canneries would employ more white men than ever before during the coming season. More white men will get work for three weeks, shouted someone in the crowd. Councilman Jack Trafton was then called upon and urged the crowd to send a delegation to the cannery men before taking steps to drive out the Japanese. <clears throat> Brady then took the floor and said, you have got them scared already and now it's the time to go to it and get what you want. I'm ashamed of this spineless bunch of councilmen. More citizens are here than ever turned out of the council meeting before, yet they are trying to crawl out. Who are they representing anyway? This is the night, the big night tonight, when we will start the Japs on their way. Let's take the council along. The cannery men will not lose a cent as they are protected by ample bonds and they do not stand to lose a dollar. Now we want an expression from this council. They do what we want, all's well and good. If they don't stand by us, we'll take them along with us. Reverend Ferguson tried to overcome the idea of violence. Deep in your hearts, you know there is a sensible way to go to this, at this problem. The riot spirit doesn't get you anywhere. I've faced mobs before. I do not hate anyone who lives by the sweat of his brow. I have protected foreigners before, and I am ready to do so again. If you draw a club against a laboring man, the club and the gun will be raised against you. I will protect them as I would protect you. We should go to the cannery men and tell them what we want. You use force, and you enlist force against you. There is no intent to use force if there are any other means, replied Mr. O'Grady. The council doesn't care to come. They will go where they will not be elected next year. The motion was then put and carried that the council go along. Outside, however, most of the council made their way home. The crowd then went down to 5th Street and up to 7th Street to Roman home where a committee consisting of O'Grady, Councilman Dover, and E.D. Hanson waited on the cannery men. Mr. Lowman said he made his contract last fall and would continue his policy, which is to use white men where possible. He declared that he will use more white men this year than ever before.
Fred B. Fulton of the Porter Fish Company said he employed 15 Japanese and that he would be willing to employ white help if he could be assured steady help and said he would take the matter up in the morning with a contractor in Seattle supplying his labor. Mm, okay. yeah. So maybe just take um, just this moment to take a collective breath. information is going to continue to digest if you'll allow it. And feeling discomfort and rage or sadness or confusion. Just allow that to be with you. And we take some wonderful um, suggestions about how to be with this discomfort, with moving. That's what Manicum is has a great book out about how to digest clean pain. Clean pain versus dirty pain. Dirty pain is when we react. Clean pain is when we can sit with and allow healing to happen that can be uncomfortable by moving and by moving. So take that with you as a suggestion to help process this. Well, we also want to know how that sits with you. We have just a few minutes left. How are you? What was it like to read this out loud? What moments stood out to you from reading it? Or, or hearing it? I feel like this is something we've yet seen again in more recent times. And it feels uncomfortable that we haven't learned from one of many first times more than a hundred years ago, and some of the language feels so familiar. I remember being at a city council meeting just recently where there was like the hundreds for um, ousting a group of people in our community recently. Can you expand? The houseless. And then being so disturbed in the next eight years at the racism that just reared its ugly head, you know, because of that. But you know, it's like, how many steps forward, how many steps back? It's just, you know, it's. Well, it seems like we move from one group to another. We move from the Salish to the Chinese to the Japanese yeah. to the black to the Mexican now or whoever. I mean, we yeah. never. We don't learn any lessons from, you know, whatever. I mean, it's just like people need somebody to pick on. Or if they aren't getting what they feel like they need, then it must be somebody's fault. Yeah. Right. yeah I mean, the Japanese took those jobs. I mean, did the whites really want those jobs? I mean, were they willing to work that hard? I mean, I don't you know. Right. It's because at the end, it's there's a, a cannery person who says he'd be happy to supply more contract if there was available white labor. Exactly. Yes, exactly. exactly. So you're bringing up a really big point that it's not just about an individual crowd or type of person that this ideology is directed to, right? It travels throughout time. And I'm wondering, does anybody else have reflection on that? What do you think that's about? What is that coming from? What is the root of that instinct? Fear. Fear. Fear, Fear and differences. Fear and indifference. Well, or difference. Difference. Well, because my granddaughter was went to school here for a bit. You guys know Audrey, and she liked when her mom would do the braids because she's got the real 
thick, curly African hair. And so her mom would do the braids because then she didn't have to comb it. But one day she went to school with them newly done and got teased. And so she had ripped them all out during mm. school and came home kind of, mm. you know, so it still goes on. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And that is exactly the kind of story that is about how it affects someone's body that they live with their whole life, potentially, that doesn't end up in a newspaper. Right. And I'm wondering with that root of that violence that you're saying stems from fear, what is the antidote to that? What is the what is the response to heal that understanding? Education, I think, understanding, yeah. you know, um, learning, making friends with the others. <laughs> and I'd like to go back to even what we talked about at the beginning is understanding what waters we're in. How how is our being white, not having to really notice that, how is that supporting suppression, oppression? How can we look at the history of liberation movements and do it differently this time? One way is to link arms and not say, no, you know, the feminist movement, well, you're gay, so, you know, and everyone's calling us the <coughs> so you sit down, we're just gonna keep moving forward for the rights of women, and then, you know, those of us who are part of the LGBTQ community don't get acknowledged, we get pushed out. Now, let's learn from our mistakes in that way and link arms and not let our houseless folks down, not let our brown and black friends down, not, not let our um, other folks down, but Trans link arms. Youth. Trans, Trans youth. youth, exactly right. Yeah, yeah so I, <clears throat> I looked up what the population of Anacortes was in 1900 and it was about not quite 1,500 people. Wow. So this wow. crowd of 300 wow. was wow. a fifth of the population. Wow. Wow. Which is, you know, it's a fifth of the population, but you know, there's the other four fifths. And who knows what they were thinking. And I think that has been it, you know, over the years too, is that, is that the majority think these, this minority of vocal, horrible, you know, expression um, is not what we really are. And I think when people say, oh, there's not racism in Anacortes, they think it's not who we really are. Um, but if you're not really t doing anything about it, then, you know, it's, you're allowing it. Yeah, where are the other 1,200? Yeah. Well, but remember, half of, or part of those were women and that that weren't really allowed to go out and protest like that, to, you know, back in the, so. Yes, well. So it is a larger percent of um, those, but then you still have those, yeah, that would sit back and not speak up and say this isn't right. Yeah. So, but I mean, historically, too, women actually, because of the Chinese Exclusion Act and then with trying to stop Japanese laborers, there were actually a lot of Euro-American women that right around this time started working in the canneries. Mm -hmm. So they were familiar with what was going on, too. But it doesn't appear they were at, or at least in minority, yeah. at the protest. Yeah. Well, we wouldn't be acknowledged, right? Yeah, we that's it. If, if you were there, you weren't acknowledged. Yeah, it's all men. <laughs> so I know we have to, oh, we have one last hand, and then we'll, yeah, please. I just wanted to say, a few years ago, um, in our schools, we had pulled students together and asked about their experiences with racism.
really important in what other people have mentioned. It's like there will always be pushback, right? If you're involved. The pushback is maybe actually a sign that something good is happening <laughs> because there's resistance, right? So um, in this moment, while we're, we're about to transition, we've just covered a lot. We've time traveled, we've talked about pain, you know, we've talked about how things have been changed. So it can be kind we've of tried over to stay in body. We've tried to stay in our bodies. That's a huge deal. <laughs> and it can be kind of overwhelming to then leave this space. So in this moment of like aftercare from this, I want you to ask your self with this idea of linking arms, right? Your one next step just for tomorrow that you're gonna do in response to this to take care of yourself and your community. It can be something as simple as sharing this material with someone. It can be something as simple as reaching out to volunteer, to donate. One small action that is pushing what you believe is important forward. Because we are in these tides, right? In this water. So what are what are we doing in this tidal system together? So I want you to just think about that for the next. 30 seconds. What is your action? <laughs> <laughs> <your, laughs> <laughs> and the email. Yeah. Yeah. What another thing can be if you want to sign up, we're going to be hopefully involved in more efforts. So you can sign up and we'll stay in touch. And thank you for your active participation. Yes. Yeah. It's so inspiring. Thank you. And let's one more time. We just yeah. Yeah. And, then, and, and I will tell you that I actually went to, I can't remember which one of these people, but I said, hey, you know, I had an experience that I would love to share for your research. And they mm -hmm. said, it's not documented. Mm -hmm. We right. won't take it. Right. And so I really admire your, um, you know, your, your, your commitment to primary source. Yeah. And um, I think that then we have a responsibility when we know these. Um, why don't we take about 20 seconds for silence and then I'm gonna close us in prayer. So let's do that. <laughs>